Okay, so, first of all, how are we all doing today? Good. Good. You good? Tired. Tired. Uh, okay, so first of which is, uh, how did the assignments go? Did everyone, was everyone able to do the quiz, the turning quiz, and the, I think it was the, uh, the plagiarism quiz? I think it was. Okay, awesome. Uh, well, today we're going to start by going through a bunch of slides, and I'm going to essentially be reading off a slide chart that I made here. Uh, we're going to go through the process of several things you're going to need to need for next week. We are going to be going over a few things in MLA as well, just for refreshers. And then we might talk about some of the readings if we have time. Okay. Speaking of time, but look at our time. It's 1049, so we are running a little bit behind, but that is okay. All right. I think we're going to 1140. All right. So... Let's turn our projector on here. Anytime you want to start working, it's great. Don't put me on the spot. I'll tell you what, we're waiting for this to show up. We will darken the, uh, the back. Just so you can see that a little bit better. A little bit unbalanced. Let's see if we can adjust this. That's mostly perfect. Okay. So, English 113, freshman competition point two. That was it. That was, that was a slide. Yay. Not quite over. We got a ways to go. Okay. So, syllabus highlights. We kind of already went over these. Um, you do want to make sure all your writing uh, this week includes the skills, subject, verb, agreement, nouns, pronouns, pronouns, transitions. Uh, this is just going into our lessons. Okay, so, um, so far I don't think you've had too many hard assignments. I think you've had the, had one of the mini essays, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and the discussion boards. Okay, um, so, this one's not too much. I'm going to let this on the screen just so the students at home can look at this. Um, so, read all around lab is the authority for college writing. You will read select sections every week. Your professor will grade your weekly mini essays in light of our lessons assigned this week. Uh, for students at home and for here, if you haven't looked at Purdue Owl yet, you definitely need to. It's a super awesome site, which will kind of give you everything you need to know about modern MLA. In fact, I think we're about to transition into the ninth edition MLA because they hate us and they don't want us to get used to any one you know, edition for too long. God forbid that that would be too easy. Yeah, I don't know why, the writing formats change all the time. Okay, so non-graded assignments will include your readings. Uh, this week's would have been one sports the late by Evie White and Atonement by Brett Lott. We will be watching a video on this later. Who did um, read these? Just one of you. Okay, so from now on, guys, we need to have the readings done by just so that way we can actually have a chance to discuss it. So um, I know we use this class to help us study it, but it's very important to go and try to at least have a base reading, even if you just skim through it. That's that's one thing, but yeah, that way you get ahead. Um, okay, so remember threaded discussions are worth 20% of your final grade. Keep in mind that's a big chunk. That's a whole, that's at least a letter. Um, threaded discussions are until Saturday at 11.55 p.m. Uh, late posts will not be accepted. Initial responses must be a minimum of one paragraph, six to eight sentences, very easy. Uh, two reply posts, so one paragraph, six to eight sentences each, again, very easy. If there are multiple prompts, you must do both the initial and the reply post. Discussion required uh, weeks one and five and seven, so I think week six you get a bit of a skip. Discussions are easy points. Yes, they're very easy because you don't, they don't have to be perfect, they don't have to be you know, amazing. Just you're just replying to them, giving them a decent, detailed reply. I've seen y'all do that before, so it shouldn't be that hard. Alrighty, so uh, you can log into my TFC, read the week two credit discussion. Actually, do anyone need their cell phone today? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. I want to be with some. You can log into my TFC. Go ahead and look up the week two discussion prompt. And we'll take a little time to discuss it. Just get an idea of what it's about. And if we have to pull from the reading, I'll come down here and pull from the reading. So for the week two threaded discussion prompt. I unfortunately do not get to see those. Um, if I was the professor of the class, I would, I would be able to see them, but as I'm not, I have to rely on y'all. So. And it should be on a list. It should be like on a format list that's like right at the front of your class page there. If you don't see them. Usually we label them so that they're very organized. Students at home uh, or in other classes don't want to sit here while I stand. Feel free to skip ahead a few minutes. That's all right. Right on service. You on a service? Okay. Um, do I have a discussion number two? Uh, yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's, we're looking at week two threaded discussion prompts. So you should see a prompt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's the question you're responding to. Brett Law is a highly acclaimed writer and committed believer in atonement. How does Law, uh, how does Law evidence a meaningful faith commitment through his writing talents? Feel free to examine comments from the interview with okay. Law as well. How so, does Law to Law's visual vision of spiritual and yep. integration in art? Okay. Let's see if we can find the here. I think I have a lot. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and read a little bit into that, and then we'll re-examine the question and just discuss a little bit. Okay, it's a short interview. So, then there are days like today. This is Brett Lott, he's a freelance writer living in South Carolina. Then there are days like today. We were trying to get out of the house for karate camp this morning, karate camp being a program for kids around 8 a.m. to noon for a week at the studio where Zeb has his lessons. Melanie was already gone to work, and the boys out in the garage ready to go. Except for the reefs, those Velcro sandals I told Zeb to put on before we ever got outside. But Dad, he said, we're barefoot in the studio, we don't have to wear them. Then for all the various mini school transgressions that had already been visited upon me this day, when I let the dog out this morning to relieve herself, she had made a beeline to the house under construction next door and the discarded chicken bones the framers leave there each day. A little broken up, isn't it? Zeb and Jake argued before a single light had been turned down about who, uh, who got to use the bathroom first when they woke up. I had to tell Jacob four times to comb his hair. I had to tell Zeb three times to clear the breakfast dishes. The sink was full of pots and pans from the dinner party last night. Melanie was already gone for all those terrible facts of the day thus far, and I blew up at Zed. I yelled, I shouted, I threw my hands up in the air, ranted about obeying your father, ranted about the fire ants out there on the grass where we park in the old VW bug we drive. Those ants were just waiting for bare feet and an opportunity to bite. I ranted about them never listening to me, and I ranted about and about and about. Okay, so have you ever been like that? You ever feel like so angry that you just start ranting about it and you just kind of go from thing to thing to thing? It may not be a specific thing, you're just, you're so mad you just gotta get it all out, right? Okay, so that's the stage he's in. I yelled the first 10 minutes of a 15 minute drive to the studio. My stomach turned up now about how little writing I had gotten done the day before in preparation for the above mentioned dinner party, about the deadline for a book I had missed by a month already, about the 22 page story that I was about to trash because it died suddenly the day before yesterday. All these concerns translated into a language that involved only words about Velcro sandals, fire ants, and the idea of obeying your father. My world, my world and its woes boiled down to why can't you just listen and obey me without making me yell? In the first five minutes of the drive, we passed in silence, me feeling the stupidity of it all. My yelling about things, finally, that had very little to do with these two boys, Zeph next to me, only looked out his window, as did Jacob, behind us. The two of them wondering, I imagine, if they dare speak. So again, have you ever been caught in an argument where all you just kind of want to do is just kind of like, look away, I'm going to get in this, you know, because you know it's just going to make it worse. Okay, but then we parked in front of the studio. Zed with his door open, ready to climb out, and I reached him and put my arm around his neck and pulled him to me. I hugged him and said, I'm sorry I yelled, I shouldn't have done that. That's okay, he said into my shoulder. Can we go to Wendy's for lunch, Jake said in the backseat, sensing his window of opportunity, his father can try it. By the way, that, try not to do that. If your parents just got done yelling at you and they say sorry, try not to turn that into something that's like, what else can I get out of this? It's like, take the apology. All right, um, Zed pulled away, smiling. I turned and looked at Jake, and he was leaning forward and grinning. Sure, I said, Wendy's, I said. Then I looked at Zeb, standing now and pulling forward to the seat back to let his brother out. Zeb, I said, and he looked at me. You have to wear the reefs so you don't get ant bites, okay? Okay, he said, and smiled again. By this time Jacob was out, he slammed shut the door, and they turned, ran along the sidewalk of the glass door of the place, and disappeared. Just like that. There are days like today, days with no story really other than the misstep, the idiot words and gestures, the sincere belief for a moment, however blind, that all this yelling actually might do some good. When the world in Velcro sandals seem somehow malevolently aligned against you, then the right word, the right gesture, and the lunch of Wendy's atonement after confession. No story other than that feeling of being father. Okay, so let's read the question again. The prompt. The whole thing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brett Lott is a highly acclaimed writer and a committed believer in atonement. How does Lott evidence a meaningful faith commitment through his writing talents? Feel free to examine comments from the interview with Lott as well. How do you respond to Lott's vision of spiritual intonation in art? Okay, so we probably can't answer all of it just based off the interview. You want to look at some more about it. But based off the interview, how do we see some evidence of his belief in atonement? He knows that, like, when like when he did something wrong, he knows that he should say sorry. Okay. And not to, I guess, like, 
walk off and like not say anything at all. Okay, good. So there is a there is a part of him in his heart, his conscience, that recognizes that what he did was arguably wrong. That maybe his points weren't necessarily wrong, but the way he expressed them, the way he got it out, was was in the flesh, right? So he takes a moment to step back and realize that who does he? What does he love more? Does he love his children more, or does he love himself more? Which of the two? His children, right? So at first he's, he's looking at himself and saying, oh, I have to deal with all this, I don't want to deal with this, it's not my fault, they're not listening to me. But ultimately he knows that the people he loves are the people he's going to defer to in the end. Okay, so um, how does this kind of relate to some of the themes we were talking about last week when we were talking about being a light and being a salt? Being a salt there, being the light. Well, he was bringing life to the situation where he had apologized and okay. like, kind of hugged his son and brought it back to forgiveness. And okay. So, as a representation as a father figure in this case, um, how might he be acting like the light? You know, at first he's not, right? At first he's kind of, he's dimming out and his sons probably don't have anything to do with him because he's just yelling and screaming. But in the end, what is he showing his sons? Is it okay to be angry or not? Yes. Sure, but what do you do after that? Apologize. You apologize, right? You let it go. You give it up because ultimately love is more important and ultimately following the scriptures is more important. So he's showing his sons a representation saying, it's okay to get angry. It happens. But, you know, as the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your ear, right? Don't let it fester. So he's doing that. He's showing an example of this. Okay, so that ought to give you an idea for a discussion point, uh, maybe something to look at for when you do your discussion today or tomorrow, whenever you decide to put them in. Okay, moving on. Let's see here, we are on slide five or six. Okay, yeah, so we're on the mini essay assignment. Okay, so how did you do on your mini essays last week? I haven't gotten my grade at all. How do you think you did? How do you feel? I think I did okay. Like, okay. until I see the grade, I won't know for sure, but like, I think I did okay for like first time. Okay, so. What was the prompt for the essay in this case? Basically. It was like your right your journey of learning how to read and write, um, and like how does that affect your view on education? It was basically mm -hmm. like a well educated like version of a diary of okay. how you were. Yeah. So it was a bit more personal mm -hmm. and a personal reflection. That's good. That probably does make it easier. I would imagine as long as you stuck with MLA and all that, you should be I would think it would be good. Alright, so Many of these require you to analyze, reflect on moral values, and assign readings. That was similar to what you just described. You will respond to a defined prompt, proper grammar, spelling required, all that good stuff. MLA format is not required, but will greatly help your grade. In other words, use it. So we, we did this last week, but just as a reminder, if they if, if a professor puts something like this, she wants it. Just letting you know. Uh, it, it's like a hint of saying, I'm not going to force you to do it, but as adults, you make your own choices, so. Uh, and use MLA. That's a good idea. I think she's doing, I'm assuming right now she's still on MLA 8th edition, right? I think. Okay. Okay. So as far as I know, nobody has officially made that transition, but you might want to check with her uh, and see if she's moved to 9th, because I think we're in the transition phase of 9th right now, which is crazy. Okay. Um, Alright, so log into TFC. Yeah, if you would go ahead and read the mini essay prompt for this week, this is week 2. And yes, if you want feedback on your essay, send it to me uh, by Thursday. So, if you want feedback, I recommend that you do. Um, you do not have to if you feel very confident that you're going to do fine in the essay, that's fine. But if you would like me to look over some stuff, give me some suggestions, I will do my very best to get back to you within that day. And for you students at home, uh, or in the other class, you know, same thing, if you're a teacher, you're a facilitator, uh, if you are curious about how good your essay is, send her your mini essay, let them know. But hey, can you give me a little feedback? Uh, if they have time, they should be able to look through and give you a few suggestions. So here's the prompt. You want okay. To yeah. um, and once more to the lake, uh, E.B. White uses vitalized symbolic language to convey meaningful themes. Okay. okay. In a formal essay of a minimum of 600 words, identify the overarching theme of this work, how does White employ symbolism and figurative language to project these perspectives? Does this essay offer any form of identification value for today's readers? Okay, good. We don't have to discuss that too much in this class, especially since I haven't quite gotten to the readings yet, 
but keep that in mind when you do the readings, look for symbolism, look for his style, what he's trying to get at. We will be watching, I think we'll get to it, we'll be watching a video today, just a short one, about that story by E.B. White. So we might discuss a little bit later. Okay, moving on to, all right, so, because knowing proper MLA format is important in this class, we're going to spend the next few minutes refreshing your MLA skills. I think most of you are familiar with it, but let's just check it. Okay, now, if you notice, what does it say? Ninth edition. So I would double check with your professor. She may not care whether it's eighth or ninth, but I'm willing to bet that you want to at least brush up on your ninth edition and we'll be going over these. I'll be interested to see if these change anything. Okay, many instructors who require their students to use MLA formatting and citation have small exceptions to different MLA rules. Every bit of instruction and direction given in this presentation comes with this recommendation. Always follow the specific instructions given by your professor. This is absolutely true. Every professor is going to be persnickety about certain things in MLA. For me, for whatever reason, it is spacing. So like a lot of y'all will put the spacing where you, you do the paragraphs and everything looks great, but then you start a new paragraph and there's a slight extra space and then you can see it. And, yeah, it's not a big deal. There's an easy way to fix it. Um, literally, you go into the line spacing on your paragraph options and just set line spacing to before or after zero for the whole document. It'll fix that just like that. But yeah, a lot of people will see another thing that I'll notice, and it, it's a lot of students don't notice that I don't, it's not, I'm not surprised, is the centering uh, of a title or whatever. You hit the center, what will happen is, you know, sometimes Microsoft Word will think you're trying to put it in a paragraph so it'll indent it for you, and then you center it, so it's like a center with an extra indent. So it's just slight off to the right. It's like, mm, and then my OCD kicks in, and I'm like, nope, I don't like that. Now, generally when I teach classes, uh, I've done a few classes at TFC, when I do them, um, if I see one MLA error, I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it, it happens. You know? But if I see like three or four MLA errors, that's when I start taking off points. So you wanna try to fi uh, fix as many of them as you can. Some professors are not that persnickety about it. As long as you follow a base format and you have a couple things off, if they see that you follow the basic structure, they may not be too hard on you, but always double check. Just try to polish it. Um, okay, so. That being said, always follow your instructor's guidelines. They will be specific if there's something they don't like. All right, eight. The entire document should be double spaced, including the heading, block quotations, footnotes, endnotes, and the list of works cited. So that has not changed from eighth edition. There should be no extra space between paragraphs. Mm -hmm, see? Um, leave only one space after periods or punctuation. So all this is the same as eighth edition. Set the margins of your document to one inch on all sides. That's eighth edition. Uh, indent the first line of paragraphs uh, from the left inch margin. Again, all this so far is exactly the same. MLA recommends that you use the tab key as opposed to pushing the space bar five times. Yes, because the tab key is designed for indentation. It's, it's basically the indent key. If you press space five times and you miss one or whatever, it can mess it up. Again, your professor may not care too much, but why bother trying to check it? Okay. So, um, these are all very similar to 8th edition and 9th edition. I don't see any major differences, really. Um, no. Okay. So, any questions on this? Anything you didn't know? All right. Cool. So, and uh, font should be what? Times, times, times New Roman. So, be careful about this, by the way, because you might set it to Times New Roman if you're doing, say, Google Docs or whatever, PDF Writer, whatever you're using, and then you transition it to Word or you send it in and it doesn't show up as Times New Roman. That's because when you switch a program to a poker program, it doesn't know it needs to switch fonts. So just be careful about that. Same thing when you're printing out pages or sending a printed form to your teacher like a PDF form. Sometimes when it formats, it'll actually push your works cited page like down or up or whatever. You know. that so much. Yeah, it, it's, you gotta just check it. The best way to check it, click print as if you're going to print your paper, but don't print it. And then look at the print sheets and it will look exactly as it would if you were sending it to somebody. It's a little uh, uh, hack there. So, life hack. Okay. Number nine, so create a header that numbers all pages consecutively in the upper right hand corner, one half inch from the top, and flush with the right margin. Again, no difference from the eighth. Your instructor may ask you to omit the number on your first page. That does depend on the instructor. I usually don't care. I gotta be honest. If, if I see uh, one at the first page or just zero uh, or just like nothing, as long as your name is on there and then you continue the page count, personally, I like it. But she may want something different and she has every right to ask that. Um, okay, so check with her. Always follow your instruction guidelines. Yada yada. If the project has several authors and they do not all fit in the header, use only the page number. Yes. Okay, any questions on this one? Okay, so with this one, let's see, is this going on to the. Yeah, okay, so header, page number, located over here. Italics for the title, container words, e.g., books, and quotation marks 
for source in the container ED tackers within books. Now, nope, that's the same. That didn't change either. So, so far, I'm not seeing anything different uh, with ninth edition. Makes me wonder why they why there is a ninth edition. It's like they're probably just trying to sell books. We're doing the exact same thing as eighth edition, but we'll call it ninth, and then people will buy the books. So, all right. Do not make a title page for your paper unless specifically requested. That is also true. Usually the only time you do like a title page is like a research project or like a bigger paper, you'll have a title page. If you're doing a thesis, you know, like a full on thesis, you'll have a title page. Usually smaller essays, you don't need one. Uh, it's just not necessary. Um, okay, so do not do it unless specifically requested or if the paper is assigned as a group project. In the case of a group project, list all the names of the contributors, giving each name its own line and header, um, followed by the remainder of the standard MLA 9 header as described below. Uh, format the remainder of the page as requested by the instructor. So in the upper left hand corner of the first page, you'll list your name, your instructor's name, of course, and the date. Pretty much standard stuff. You'll double space again, send another title. Do not underline, italicize, or place your title in quotation marks. Write the title in title case, which is standard capitalization. Not all caps, but just every, every first word is capitalized. Okay. Um, use quotation marks and or italics when referring to other works in your title, just as you would for your text. So, fear, loathing in Las Vegas is morality play, human weariness in after apple picking, which is where it comes from. So you put that in quotations and they actually got these quotations backwards. Mm -hmm. Funny. Okay, double space between the title and the first line of text. So the whole document, really easy, should just be double space. That should, that should not change. Just make it, again, unless I see something different at night, uh, which so far I haven't, everything is going to be double space. There should never be extra spacing. If you see any extra spacing, it's probably wrong. Um, okay, create a header in the upper right corner that includes your last name followed by the space or the page number. Number all pages consecutive, one, two, three, four, and yada, yada. One can pass down, so this, uh, this is all same, same, nothing's new. Um, your instructor or other readers may ask you to omit the last page, uh, last name or page number header on your first page. We just went over that again. They're repeating it. Same thing. Okay, let's, may, let's move on to slide 11. You'll see kind of an example of what you're looking at here. Now, if you notice, there's no extra space in here. So double all the way is the exact same spacing. What you will often see is right in between here and here, between this title and here, and between these four marks. Those are where you'll typically see those extra spaces. And then if there's like a new paragraph down here, you'll see an extra spacing. So check and see that this space matches this space. If this one looks up a little bit further, you probably need to set that line spacing to zero. So, and I will tell you that if you're using Microsoft Word, it will do that by default, so always check it, because it's not set to perfect MLA. So there's about five or six tweaks you'll have to do. And they're very easy, I mean, it won't take you very long, but that'll, it'll save you a lot of, a lot of uh, stress over your MLA format. Okay. Alright, do not make a title page for your paper. Okay, I'm just going to skip that. We already know that. That's um, extra. Right. We move on, so. Okay. Create a header in the upper right hand corner that includes your last name, followed with the space by the page number. Okay. Um, Check and see if there's anything here I think we need to worry about. You know, this one half inch uh, from the top, flush with the right margin. All right, nothing new. Any questions about this? Does this look like something that you're not used to for any reason? I wouldn't think so. Okay. All right, MLA formatting. You are likely writing your essays in Microsoft Office 365 using Word Online. Is that true for just about everyone, pretty much? Okay, let me be okay. You, 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 I use Google Docs. Google, oh, Google Docs works. As long as you can format it to, to the same format, it works. There, yeah, you can pretty much do all the same options, I think. Um, it's very easy to format a uh, paper and MLA format with Microsoft Word. Uh, there's a quick video that will explain these steps, so we will watch that real quick. Let's see if I actually have the download of Hold on one second. I'm going to pull off the HDMI just so I know. I'm reading the right video. I don't want to go onto the class page. I'm not supposed to show that to y'all, so you've got to be careful. She made her downloads. Descriptive writing. Oh, that's the MLA video. We don't have to show that. Never mind. Let's see. Never mind. We're going to go pop back up. That's not what I wanted. This is an MLA formatting video. Um, there should be a link to this on the class page, and I'll put one up. And you can watch this later. It's not actually important that we watch it now, so we're going to go ahead and move on from that as well. That's not the video I want to watch. I was thinking of study.com video, but that's not at all. Okay, so we're going to move on from that. 
Okay, so for you kids at home, uh, there should be a video link to Microsoft 365 Word Online on the class page. Um, I will put one on mine, and you should go look that up. So it's not very hard. It's just a basic tutorial of how to use Microsoft Word Online, giving you uh, steps on how to do the different tweaks. Uh, most of Microsoft Word is actually very self-explanatory. You've probably have used enough of it or Google Docs. Um, you, as far as I know, you're allowed to use Google Docs if you want to. That being said, be careful using Google Docs because it's not formatted quite as efficiently as Word is. So make sure you double check everything. Otherwise, you should be good. Okay, so although not required, using in-text citations in your mini essays will help you get the best grade possible. We already went over this. When it says not required, but you'll get a better grade for it, it basically is required. So if you just don't want to write grade, that's fine, but I think you do, and I'm sure it's not that much extra work. So especially since you actually have the sources already available to you, um, you should be able to print those off and do a very quick, easy citation. You don't have to go online and find one that's already there. Uh, okay, so basic in-text citation rules. All right, the source information in a par par uh, parenthetical citation should direct readers to the source's entry in the works cited list. Uh, so if you have an in-text citation, there should also be a works cited list directing you to where that in-text citation came from. The in-text citation should be placed, if possible, where there is a natural pause in your text. If the citation refers to a direct quotation, it should be placed directly after that. So if you're using an actual quote, you need the citation right after the quote, you know, or at the very end of the sentence where that quote is, so that they know that's where you got that quote. If you're paraphrasing, you can go on for a little bit until you've kind of come to like a natural pause, maybe the end of your paragraph or the end of that part of the section paragraph, then put the citation in. Does that make sense? Okay. Pretty good? Okay. Okay. All right. Any source information that you provide in text must correspond to the source information on the works cited page. More specifically, whatever single word or phrase you provide to your readers in the test must be the first thing that appears on the left hand margin of the corresponding entry in the works cited list, so the author's last name or the title. In other words, your in text citation should match with your bibliography or whatever we call your works cited. Um, the, technically speaking, if you put an in text citation in there and you don't include it in your works cited list, it could be considered plagiarism. Weirdly enough, even though you are giving credit to the author, just because they can't find it or can't match it to that work cited, it's, it could be considered plagiarism. It's, it's usually a minor form, and most of the time your teacher will catch that and say, hey, this wasn't in your bibliography. They probably won't give you a zero. They'll be like, hey, you just need to add that in the work cited. We've had students do that before, and, and it's, it's an honest mistake most of the time. Okay, so let's see, moving on. Any questions on this slide, by the way? Good? Okay, moving on. Sorry about the long PowerPoint. This is week two. We have to get through it. So, okay. MLA format follows the author's page method of in-text citation. This means that the author's last name and the page number from which the quotation or paraphrase is taken must appear in the text, and a complete reference should appear in your work cited page. The author's name may either appear in the sentence itself or in the parentheses following the quotation or paraphrase, but the page number should always appear in the parentheses, not in the next of your sentence. Um, it, yeah, because here's why. If you say the page number in the text of your sentence, it kind of looks wonky. It's just like, if you read Evie you know, White on page 65, it, it just looks weird in your writing. Whereas if you're like, well, Evie White says blah, 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 and then you put page 65. It just looks nicer. It's a better style. All right. The both citations of the in-text examples on the slide 263. Was, uh, words for 263 here, and then also just 263. Now, why are they not putting it in 263 here, or just not words for here? Why would they not include that? Good. They've already mentioned the author in the sentence. If you mention the author in the sentence, you don't have to mention them in the citation. If you don't mention the author in the sentence, you do need to mention them in the citation, just in case, just to avoid confusion. Now, in something like Turabian, I think MLA has something for this too, if you're using the same source repeatedly, uh, there's a way you can put like IBID, uh, and it's like IBID, and it essentially just means the same person. That's all you're saying, it's just IBID2, IBID80, IBID60. You're just saying I'm using the same guy over and over. Um, I don't know exactly what the process is for MLA for IBID. It might be different, because in terrain units, it's IBID. Okay. So, let's see. All right, we can move on. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Intake citations for print sources with a known author. For print sources like books, magazines, scholarly journal articles, and newspapers, provide a single word or phrase, usually the author's last name and a page number. If you provide the single word or phrase in the sentence, you do not need to include it in a parenthet parenthetical citation. The examples must correspond to an entry that begins with, say, Burke, which will uh, be the first thing that appears on the left-hand margin mentioned in the works cited list. Okay, so 
Uh, in this case, you see like Kenneth Burke is simply using three. They labeled the author, you don't have to put the name in. Or in this case, they did in Burke three. So that's just the trigger word. That's letting you know that's what you're referring to. Uh, sometimes it can be like a short title. Like, let's say that you read Apples, Apples and Oranges is the title of a magazine or something, but you don't have a direct author. You can just put Apples and Oranges in the page number, and then that lets them know it's from that source. Um, usually, if you're going to put a title, and it's, let's say it's a really, really long title, uh, I don't know, uh, Democratic and Social Reform is a catalyst in Victorian or Britain, okay, you don't want to put that whole thing in the in-text citation, just put Democratic or you know, so whatever the first two words are, that'll help out a lot. Okay, so I'm going to get a quick look at our time because we did get started late. We are 11.19, so we've got 20 minutes. We're good. Okay. Citing the Bible. Okay. In your first parenthetical citation, you want to make clear which Bible you're using. Italicize the titles. Each version varies in its transition, followed by book. Do not italicize chapter and verse. Do not include page numbers because the page numbers will always change depending on which translation you're using. If future references employ the same edition of the Bible using, list only the book, chapter, and verse in the in-text citation. Um, okay, so just out of fun, what, what Bibles do you typically like to read? What's your favorite translation? Uh, I have a lot. A lot? I read, I only King James. King James? It's got a really modern, modern, modern one. Modern one? Well, there's New King James, right? Too, like King normally, King James. normally in our family, it's either King James or New King James. New King James, okay. Uh, same for y'all. Oh, well, you're a sister, so now. Kind of like New Living Translation. New Living Translation, okay. I think I've got a Christian standard, but yeah, so they're all going to be slightly different, at least, like, maybe majorly different, depending on, like, how far the translation goes. So when you're doing that, you want to label which translation you're using. Because if someone, say, you, you use King James, but somebody who looks it up in the Christian standard, you're like, that doesn't look right. Even though it's not actually plagiarism, again, could be construed as plagiarism because maybe you worded something off. But again, that just makes you tired. Did you have a question? Yeah, I use the website. You can. I'm not. Do I want to decide the website? No, you want to try to find the, 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 if it's using a website that's using a certain version of the Bible or whatever, it should list that version somewhere. It should list the version. You won't need to page the numbers, so don't worry about that, but definitely at least list the version of what you got. Um, you can list the DOI, which is the, the website address as well, to give that reader context that, oh, it is a website. Um, okay, so, any questions on time the Bible anymore? No. It's a good question, by the way. So. Okay, so, when a source has no page numbers or any other part number, no number should be given in the in or no number should be given in an in-text citation. In other words, if you don't have a number, don't put one. Um, do not count unnumbered paragraphs, pauses, or other parts. This is an example of how to cite a direct quotation from a speech. So an in-text example, disability activism should work towards and then the quotation creating a capital space for all beings. This is by Garland Thompson. There was apparently no page number, so just put the name of the author. Um, almost always you will either have an author's name or a magazine title or a page number. One of the three. You should have at least one of the three, hopefully two of the three. Um, and so if it's like a magazine title or something, just put the magazine title in there. If you don't have a page number or an author, that's all you got. So always try to double check because sometimes you might miss a page number where you didn't look for it or maybe the author's listed somewhere. So try to find it if you can, but if it's not available, it's not available. It's one of those things. Okay, let's see. Short quotations. If a quotation runs no more than four lines and requires no special emphasis, put it in quotation marks and incorporate it into the text. Provide the author and specific page citation in the text and include a complete entry in the works cited page. Punctuation marks such as periods, comma, semicolon should appear after the parenthetical citation. Another quick thing, I don't think it says in here. Yeah, okay. So another thing, unless this has changed to the permanent condition, which I'm almost certain it has not, if you are including a quote from somebody, do not change the grammar. Whatever the grammar is, don't change it. If somebody misspelled something, or if somebody capitalized something kind of odd that doesn't make sense to you, or a grammar punctuation is weird, the reason being is whenever that was made, whenever that quote was made, might be a different time, might be a different, you know, way of looking at things, maybe just the author's mistake. Either way, all you're doing is taking what that author wrote and putting it in your paper. That it's not your fault they made a mistake, or the editor. It's you're just copying it. So literally you do not have to change anything if you're taking the direct quote. Now, obviously if it's like in some some different font, you still have to put it in time in the Roman font. It still needs to be uh, MLA uh, savvy. But if it's just a direct quote, you don't have to mess with anything. Okay, um, quotation marks and exclamation points should appear with, within the quotation marks if they are a part of the quoted passage, but after the parenthetical, yeah, parenthetical citation if they are part of your text. So if they're within the quote, uh, you no, should see it. That's weird, it's not showing an example of that. Let me read that, make sure I got it right. Question marks and exclamation
exclamation points specifically. Oh, well, that's because there are no question marks and exclamation points. Okay, so if it's a question mark and exclamation point, it should appear within the quotation marks if they are part of the quoted passage. But if they're only a part of the parenthetical citation, you put them outside in the parentheses. That makes sense. They just didn't show because they didn't have a question mark. Okay. In quotation marks. Okay. Where's the last one? At the very okay. end. Well, not only that, but they also forgot the other. No, okay. So that should be this profound. Profound aspects of personality and expressing. Well, now I'm confused. Well, it it may be because general, well, the reason I say this, generally speaking, if the, if the question mark is part of the quotation, yeah. you would include it. Right. So that's why. Um, in this case, it's not. This is she is expressing, or he or she is expressing a question themselves, and they happen to be including a quote in that. Question. So okay, that's all right. That makes sense now. So if the quotation mark is in the quotes, you would include it. Um, like, like if it's a question mark or exclamation point specifically. Okay, that's interesting. That's a, that's a that's a rule I'm a little unfamiliar with. All right. If you add words or words in quotation, you should put brackets around the words to indicate that they are not part of the original text. This is illustrated in the first example on this slide. I think we're moving on. Right, let me see. It might be the next slide. Did I skip a step? Hold up. Might have happens. Yes, I did. So one more. There they are. Brackets. Okay. These are where brackets are like. So they look similar to parentheses, but they're more rigid. So like we're like rectangle the ends of a rectangle. Okay. So yes, if you add words or words in a quotation, you should put brackets on the words to indicate they're not part of the original text. So it's okay to actually put words in a quotation as long as you're indicating this is my translation of those words. So, in fact, a place you'll see this a lot is your Bible. You'll often see this like in the, in the bottom notes or footnotes. Um, you might see like they'll put a quotation like, you know, note one is they'll list the verse in quotations and then put a bracket in the middle. Or even in your Bible, in the direct text, they'll put a bracket like it's trying to translate, translate the word for you. It's that Bible's translation of what those words would mean. So, that happens uh, a lot in uh, biblical text, but you'll also see it in writing of all kinds. Okay, uh, moving on. This shouldn't be too hard, so that's just basically if you're going to add words within the quotes, you put brackets around them because those are your words. Okay. Citations. Many times uh, online works, like the ones you're reading for class, will tell you the proper way to cite the work. If there's nothing in the work, then use the citation generator uh, found at citationmachine.net. There's also easybib.com. There's a bunch of different citation generators. Um, that being said, I want to say it says it later on, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it now. Be very careful using citation generators of any kind. It's like using a calculator. Yes, it'll help you, but it may not give you the exact perfect answer if you put in anything incorrectly or whatever. Or even if you put in everything incorrectly, um, it may not format it perfectly. So it will try to, but always double check it. If you have a reference like um, MLA 8th or MLA 9th book, check it uh, or go to Purdue Al, give it a double check, make sure it looks correct. Um, you just you don't want to be too lazy just using the MLA citation generator, turn it in thinking like nothing's wrong, and then your professor looks over and says, why is the title repeated four times in your text? Because the citation generator just goofed. And so always give it a look over. Okay. So, oh, there it is in red. Do not rely solely on citation generator. I missed the big bold letters in red on the sheet, by the way, because I'm really smart. So, all right. So, 24. So, uh, essay number one, this is the, one of the big essays, it's going to be worth 20% of your final course grade, it'll be 1,100 words, I think so, they already wrote it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. A descriptive narrative about your hometown, your past, and present perspectives. Analyze how local cultural influences impacted you. Vividly describe the neighborhood's physical features, distinctive customs, annual events, and so on. We're not going to go into this because we did this last week, we actually discussed kind of like all this, so we're not going to repeat that. Um, for you guys at home, you probably live somewhere, so try to think about that. Hopefully you live somewhere. If not, I'm really worried about how you got into college, so, or how you got into this class at all. All right, descriptive writing. Okay, so we do have a descriptive writing video we're going to watch real quick. I'm going to do the pause thing, pull this up. You should have access to this video on your class page. 
But just in case, we'll watch it now. Is writing that describes people, places, animals, or objects in such a way that allows the reader to be a strong image in their mind. Good descriptive writing shows rather than tells. Let's take a look at an example of descriptive writing. The cool evening wind moaned, toying with the tiring tree branches. Leaves tumbled off the tiled roof and fell to the ground, burying the yard under a patchwork quilt of yellow and brown. A curious squirrel scampered down the trunk and disappeared into a rustle of leaves. Okay, so, go ahead and tell me how is this an example of descriptive writing? What words give it away? The, definitely, the, like, words, like, toying and, okay. uh, the, like, phrase, like, patchwork, quilt of yellow and brown. Okay, there you go. So you're getting visuals, you're getting kind of, like, uh, essentially this picture, right? It's painting a picture of what's happening, right? This is a really good example of, of descriptive writing. Okay, um, authors really love to do this, especially fictional authors. If you ever read a book that, like, man, the author, for whatever reason, just had perfect wording, mm -hmm. and just they painted a perfect picture, and you, you were just in that story, yet yeah, a good author will know how to do that. Notice that this text shows more than it tells. It shows the reader it's windy. It shows the reader the season. Did you remember that? Uh, oh, Let's break down four components that make for effective descriptive writing. Does it? Number one, pay attention to details. Pay attention to details. Whereas regular writing might see a red apple, descriptive writing sees the detail of the stem, okay. the changing current. I have to pause here, ladies and gentlemen, because I've just been informed we're about to go to library class. So, we're going to stop recording. Will this be on the...